Hello and welcome to the 48th episode of The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And it's my distinct honor to welcome Stephen Hunter, who is not only a New York Times bestselling author, but a Pulitzer Prize winner, which we'll discuss inside the show. And if you've ever heard or read about Bob Lee Swagger, then you likely know these books. Point of Impact, the one that started it all and became the film Shooter. Black Light, Time to Hunt, The 47th Samurai, Night of Thunder, Ice Sniper, Dead Zero, The Third Bullet, Sniper's Honor, G-Man, Game of Snipers, and his latest, Targeted. Stephen also has three Earl Swagger books, two Ray Cruz books, eight standalone novels, and three nonfiction books, two of which are a compilation of essays on movies. And given his Pulitzer Prize was for criticism, it's easy to see why the books are so good. The last thing I'll mention is that Stephen offers his succinct and powerful six key words for creating a successful writing career. So if you're a writer in the making, you're going to like this. Without any further ado, here's Stephen Hunter in The Thriller Zone. Well, good morning, sir. Well, good morning to you, David. (laughs) Well, happy Friday. There's a great way to start it, isn't it? It sure is. I can't wait. On Friday, my wife allows me a martini. So uh, let's get this over with so I can get my damn martini. (laughs) I have to tell you, David, I don't hear very well. So I may answer questions you haven't asked. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I know you'll be able to go with that, but I'm just giving you a little early warning. Fair enough. That's fair. I, I'm, and I'm not that smart, so whatever okay, you good. say is going to... be Two morons chatting. This will go well. <laughs> Everything's going to feel brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's an honor to have you on the show, Stephen. I mean, it, it really is. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And we're going to be talking about this little fine gem, Targeted, which is a hell of a ride. Uh, we're going to get to this in a second, but okay. I'd love to, I'd love to warm up with a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, uh, a lot of us know that you you were a journalism major and that you worked on the copy desk of the Baltimore Sun and film critic for the Washington Post. Uh, and 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 excuse my ignorance, but uh, or silly question, but. Um, to be able to win, and only, I think, one of two people to win a Pulitzer Prize for criticism, how does that happen, and what does that feel like? And I know it's been a while. It's easier to tell you what it feels like than it is to tell you why it happened. What it felt like was, and I'm stealing this line from Richard Condon, someone had poked a hole in the floor of heaven, and a cloud of hot bliss was pouring (laughs) down upon me. Uh, they called me up to this little room. I thought I was in trouble. I walked in the room. All the big shots were there. I thought I was really in trouble. Try to think, what on earth could I have done? So bad that they all had to get together to fire me. And they told me I'd won the prize. And it's sort of a blank after that. I'm told, I, I was later told, I jumped three feet in the air. Uh, that's higher than I've ever gotten off the planet before on my own accord. And uh, it was just a few minutes of extraordinary happiness. To be honest, it was also sort of like a jolt of bourbon in that it was an immediate explosion of pleasure, but at the same time you understood would be temporary. And I was old enough to get that. And uh, so I was able to get through the next few weeks understanding that it would go away and that people would stop congratulating me sooner probably rather than later and that it would just it would just be you know something that was over and it was over and uh my publishers have insisted of putting it on the cover of all my books even though technically the pulitzer prize i won was for criticism it has nothing to do with my novels uh, and I, I, as my joke is, I say, I keep meaning to write them a letter about that. Hmm, maybe <laughs> I'll do it. May I'll probably do it tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I'll do it tomorrow. 
I, uh, that's hilarious. And, and, and don't you say to yourself that uh, you said it was a shot of bourbon that, you know, it's going to feel good and then it's going to go away. It's kind of like all those things in life, isn't it, Stephen, that you go, Oh, if I could only achieve that and then you do, and it feels magnificent. And then you're like, okay, what's next? Or does that hang in there with you for a while? Uh, it hangs in for a while. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important though to, I, I, I mean, I, knew the wisdom uh, I knew the I knew that prizes ruin people and uh, many young journalists win one and th they are then crucified by virtue of the fact that they think everything they do from then on should be a Pulitzer quality and it can't and it won't and it never will be and the best thing you could do I say this to all potential Pulitzer Prize winners who are listening in, the best thing you can do is get back to work and uh, just uh, just do your what your job is and understand that the stories that produce this outcome, the prize outcome, are few and far between, no matter how talented you are. And so much of it also has to do with luck, with place and time and timing and who's judging, and there's all kinds of intricate uh, machinations that are involved, and a different judging panel would have not produced this outcome. Uh, it just, it's, a, it's just sort of a, some of they say, it's like you take 20 different pieces of Swiss cheese and you line them up, and about once every thousand times, you'll get one in which the holes line up perfectly and you can draw a through line through it. And that's what happens. That's what a prize like this is. You know, it makes it, that's a great analogy. It makes me think about, um, you know, you always hear people, actors living near to LA, I think of this, oh, if I could only win an Oscar, if I could only win an Oscar, and then you spend your whole life, and then about the time, a lot of people, about the time they give up, they win it. And then they, once they won it, I'm like, oh, I've heard them say, yeah, this was, Great. Well, now I want another, and it doesn't always guarantee that that'll well, that will happen. That's, it, that's exactly true, and it's a very good analogy. Uh, you always want more. There's no such thing as enough glory. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and and, and what you, you said something that I thought was very meaningful, uh, but at least as applied to me, and that is I have gotten everything I wanted, but I, I always get it after I no longer want it. You know, it's this weird dynamic in which I have a goal and I realize at a certain point it's not going to happen. I just make peace with that and I try and tell myself to forget about it and then it happens. Yeah. And I don't really, you know, it doesn't have a meaning to me. It would have had, had I gotten it when I was, in, you know, in full total obsession with it. Uh, so, you know, that's just, maybe that's fortunate because if you do get it, early and when you are obsessed with it that's when i think that you're you're in a psychological danger zone uh and uh, uh fortunately i as i said before i was old enough and wise enough to understand that uh it wasn't uh the beginning of a new world it was just the continuation of the old world with one little accolade added that most people would forget about quickly enough yeah you know, when I was reading about you and 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 your time uh, at uh, for the for these different newspapers, and I thought that was such an incredible time. It made me think of one of my favorite movies, which is um, um, All the President's Men. And I, I I I think I love watching that movie. Besides the fact it's a great script, is the camaraderie of the newsroom and how that is such a specific. Uh, environment and it makes me think of zodiac and so forth and then that made me think of you and i thought what must it be like these days where the newspaper as we knew it is kind of going away that's exactly true uh the newsroom is now sitting 10 feet behind me that as my wife who is a brilliant reporter uh the star reporter of the baltimore sun she went into the office yesterday for the first time in two years, uh, but her normal office is our dining room table. And, uh, and they, 
they still get together occasionally, but you talked about the camaraderie of the newsroom. I'm a great believer in that. And I had wonderful, wonderful years in a newsroom. And I realized that a newsroom is the only place I would have been happy. And there was something about the collection of, of talent and non-talent, the politics and the absurdity and the plots and the conspiracies and the jokes and the friendships and the enemy ships, all of that was really productive. And as a consequence, I, in, every, uh, in every book I've written, I have a kind of a portrait of uh, non-functioning bureaucracy. And all that is based on the Baltimore Sunday Sun of the 1970s. I mean, in, in one respect, my career has been one long autobiography about the Baltimore Sun in the 1970s, because that's when I first got into the business when I was lucky enough, when I was nobody in the business, when I just, uh, you know, and I was free to angrily, I must might add, watch the way things happened and developed and to enjoy the people of my generation and to resent the people of the older generation. That is until I became the older generation. And then I resented the people of a younger generation. And uh, it was all, uh, it was a great time. It, it really was a great time. And I enjoyed every second of it. I met my wife there. I, you know, it just was a, a, a good time. And all my friends I met there, and she was, uh, I think I read somewhere, she was like right across the newsroom from you, right? So it was right there in front of your face the whole time. She was. Uh, yes, that's true. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, it was, I'll tell you one interesting thing is I, when I later joined the Post, uh, I knew someone who had been very much a part of the newsroom uh, during a Watergate. And I used to listen to his stories about it. And everything he said was recognizable because it was it was typical newsroom behavior. But at the same time, it was like sitting at King Arthur's knee and listening to him reminisce about Camelot. You know, and that was for the Post. That was a particularly great time. Uh, I wasn't there for it, but just in the aftermath, even when I was there in the '90s, it was still there was still a glow to the place uh, based on that. That was a very enjoyable. Uh, place to, to make a living. And speaking of glow, I, I can only imagine having not worked in that world. How does the, how does, how do those newspapers differ from, for instance, when you worked for the Pentagon news? I mean, talking about two different universes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's go back on that one because I missed the, uh, the how do those newspapers compare to yeah, I mean, uh, working in a standard newspaper uh, room versus the Pentagon news, I, I would imagine that the mechanics of the army and such uh, would provide a much different atmosphere. I think that's well, the... that, that's true. I mean, I'm old enough to have come in in the old days of hot metal and putting together a hot metal newspaper was uh, it was lots of fun. There was something sort of, I don't know, almost aphrodisiac about watching those long rolls of linotype lead with the backwards letter on them assembled into pages. And then the pages were screwed down and it was all upside down, but there was something so, you know, it's a, one of a secret human pleasures is watching things fit. And newspaper ring was about watching things fit. And I always laugh when people would say, would think, you know, that all this thought had gone into how uh, their story was played on the page and what it represented politically and what the editors has decided. And I would say, no, no, no. The page represents the way it fitted. And that's the only thing it represented. And if your story got moved down the page, it was because they got a bigger ad later or uh, because it was 30 lines too long or something like that. I mean, it was all this technical stuff about getting these little pieces of metal into a, to line up and then in a row and then clamping them down. And then that was made into a plate. And it was the plate that was published that became the, 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 the printed newspaper. And it was just a, 
it, I mean, it's something, it's just something really, really interesting about it. And to some degree that left when the computers came in, because then it was about seeing pieces of paper glued on boards at the, at the final moment. Uh, and then uh, now I'm not, I have no idea how they do it now. I mean, it's, now it's just magic. I, I think there was little German people inside the computer, <laughs> in there, you know, working very busily to make it all happen. I have no idea how they get a newspaper out. It's so fascinating to to think, though, what you've been able to see, and it's and and that methodology that you just spoke about seems so archaic and so laborious and uh, doesn't make any sense because now everything literally is, as you said, it's keystrokes and ones and zeros. And you don't like it, you just hit return and it moves and there's none of this hours and hours of trying to move the metal around. It, well, cool. that's true. And you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me in a way of the coming of CGI to the movies. Oh. Suddenly anything is possible. And that may not be a good thing. It may be that uh, having uh, impediments to to anything is, imposes a good discipline on you and makes you much more careful in selecting what to what to do and what not to do. And uh, I, I don't know the papers today. You know, everyone on a paper today is doing seven jobs, none of which they've been trained for. And the result is, I mean, those kids work really hard to get the paper out every day, but they're much smaller. They're much more tightly focused. There's no room for the publisher's alcoholic son. There's no room for the, uh, for the stockholder. You know, there's just no room for the eccentricities and the, uh, and then, nonsense and the horseplay and the pranks that went on in the old newspaper business. Now, uh, newspaper office, it, to the degree that it's ever occupied, feels like an insurance office. You know, it feels like you're visiting uh, the equitable life assurance. And there's all these people working at terminals and you hear that, that click, click, click of the, you know, it's nothing like the sort of the sexy sound of a typewriter. I mean, that was yeah. that was one of the best sounds of the world, and that's forever exited the world. And we might as well, you know, make peace with it and remember it in our dreams, and maybe over a glass with someone else. But it's just gone. Yeah, and that is a shame. That that keystroke. And I I'm thinking back. I th yeah, it's going to be even to refer back again to all the president's men. The IBM Selectric with that rotating ball when you yeah. hit the you know even that sound that you know I miss all that sound and the way the API. Uh, I worked in radio, so the API would come across this big old monstrous machine. You know, this roll of paper would go on forever. <laughs> I actually knew a guy who collected UPI machines and had a room in his apartment that was full. It was like a ghost of X newspaper technology. And there were Underwoods there, and these big UPI machines with the rolls of yellow paper. You know, they weren't working, but they were, you know, they were so steampunk. I mean, there was no steampunk then, right. but I now realize that that style has to be called steampunk. You know, the big columns of electric tubes and and uh, wires and things like that. And then the super fast typing and the way the yellow uh, roll paper was spit out off the roll. It was just remarkable. Yeah. That year, it was just, a, it was a miracle that something could work that well, that hard, that fast without exploding because they really seemed dangerous, you know? <laughs> And speaking of danger, something just popped into my head. It had to have been about 1975, and I'll never forget this. And it, this is the difference between today's technology when you've got a, a liquid panel in front of your face. Is uh, I was working at a news station, and a friend of mine was reading the news, and I walked in one day, and I had a lighter, and I lit her. She was on the air reading copy, and I lit her copy, and it started... <laughs> to catch fire and she had to you know kind of ad lib and get out of it and i'm like yeah, yeah that kind of shenanigans wouldn't happen these days would they no it certainly <laughs> wouldn't but that connects with something that i didn't mention and the other thing about those old newsrooms was smoke yeah everybody smoked all the time 
and you couldn't have a meeting, you couldn't read a story, you couldn't write a story without firing up a cigarette. Yeah. And you just walked in to this room of fog and cancer. And it was, you know, I, I guess I'm not nostalgic about it, but it was such a, it was such a, uh, uh, it was, it, it, it was such a singular experience that I, I'll never forget it. Although I just did forget it until you called it up. But I, it, 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 it was a, it was a smoker's paradise, the newsroom. And isn't it funny, you step into any place now where anyone has a cigarette lit and it seems so completely out of the ordinary, like what in the world are you doing? It's so foreign now, but yeah. <laughs> it was great fun. It was. And I'm glad you mentioned movies because I want to I want to go to your career as movie re reviewers. And, and the very first thing that popped into my head when you said that was you mentioned CGI and I think of all the people, the actors that I watch now, instead of reacting to a person in front of them, you can, they all now have that look of when they're reacting to something that isn't there, that you know isn't there as a, yeah. in the world of CGI. Now we, the audience has become accustomed to that whole, yeah, yeah. you know, that frozen look of like, not really, I'm not really connecting, but I know that I've got to react this way. And there's such a phoniness that I, uh, it, it, it makes me crazy. Well, I think it? that I, at least for people who saw movies that were documents of photography, the, uh, when they see movies that are now documents of uh, computer technology, even if they can't specify what, they understand that something has changed. And what you said might actually be it, uh, that, that, you know, they're not acting with things in the frame. They're acting with things that will be inserted into the frame. And that lack of, of genuine uh, interaction and engagement is something, again, it's not, you know, they've, they, they've adapted to it very well, but it just, it, it's some reason it's, it's, it's some level it's difficult to describe it feels different. Yes. It's not the same. You know, I saw The Last Duel the other night. It's really quite a good movie, I think. But I realized that it was, you know, eight men in in blue jumpsuits in front of a soundstage that was blue. And then someone painted in France in, in 1381, and, you know, and then everything else was fraudulent. And it, it just, it just, it, it, it's, it, I mean, it didn't blow my mind, but realizing that made it all seem, uh, it just knowing that made it all seem different. You know, yeah. you just don't react to it in the same way in some respects. Well, there's a lack, a lack of visceral connection, that electrical visceral connection. Yes, that, indeed. Yeah. And it, and that begs this question. As a movie reviewer, uh, for, for, it's a two-part question. First of all, everyone probably thinks it's really super sexy to be a movie reviewer. Hey, you, you get to go in and sit in the dark and watch this movie and yeah. then come out and pontificate about what you thought yeah. about it. But when it's a job, there's a couple things that happen. I would have to imagine that when it's a job, part of that pleasure center that we get when we go do something frivolous, like watch a film, is gone. And then when you're forced to make a judgment on it, you know, what? how, how, how does that play out in your head? That's a well, really- Well, it's, uh, it's a good question. And the truth is, uh, you know, I romanticized that I wanted to be a movie critic for a long time before I, finally became one. And when I finally became one, I realized very quickly that as glorious and as fortunate existence as it was, it was still a job. There was still a workplace. There were still schedules. There were still hierarchies. There were still uh, deadlines. You still, uh, and for me, I'm not one of those people who has good organizational skills. So for me, it was always, and you know, you ask me what my memories of of uh, film criticism are. Mainly, it's about fighting my way through traffic to get to some <laughs> suburban theater to see to make sure I'm there in time to see the screening of uh, Freddy and the Chipmunks Seven. 
you know, and the anxiety that I felt if I didn't get the light or if the, you know, if the bus didn't clear the intersection. And that was, it, it's movie criticism is really more about scheduling than it's about anything else. And at a certain point, I said to my much younger editor, I said, Leslie, just don't make me do it myself. Just tell me where I have to be and when I have to be there. And uh, that was uh, her willing to do that for me. I was childish. Uh, it was the doting care of a young person for a senile older person. But that <laughs> made my job much easier uh, because I was always forgetting screenings or going to the wrong theater or showing up an hour early or an hour late. Or, you know, that was the nightmare aspect of the job was just the technical getting to and from the movies. Uh, and I, know that's, I, I realize how childish that sounds, but I think other film critics will understand that that's, that that's one, of the, uh, one of the real downsides of the job. And you just made me think of something, Stephen, that, that there's a differentiation between, and I feel almost ignorant that I don't know what this is, but there is there a difference between a film critic and a film reviewer? That's a good question. Uh, film critics think there is, film reviewers think there isn't. I saw myself as occupying the middle ground, and I felt that I did, particularly in some genres rather than others, I had insights to offer that others might not have and that I could bring an intellect to bear on uh, or insight to bear on story construction, on history, on the way action is photographed and moved. Those are my strengths. Uh, and when I was able to get into that part of the movie, then I thought of myself as a critic. When I'm writing about some kind of movie that I have no enthusiasm for and I'm just trying to get the facts right and the, spell the actors' names right and I'm in a hurry because I've got three more pieces to write that day, uh, you know, then I'm a reviewer and my main, uh, I'm, I'm trying to give an honest reaction to the movie but I'm also have to trying to be sympathetic with the audience that the movie is structured to meet. It doesn't make any sense. I never thought to have uh, standards uh, that were not movable in some way and that you would not judge uh, Les Enfants du Paradise the same way uh, you would judge uh, Francis the Talking Mule. And you had to understand that they were aimed at different segments of the market and you had to take that into consideration and some i guess critics would not do that and reviewers would only do that so i tried to do it where appropriate and avoid it where inappropriate and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't i mean you write a great deal as a movie critic and you look back and occasionally I will run in, I never consciously look for, but occasionally you run into an old piece, something makes you call it up. And of course, something goes away on the internet. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think, you know, I was pretty good that day. And then other times I think, man, what was I smoking? <laughs> Where was my head? I missed this, I missed that. This sentence, this paragraph makes no sense. The conclusion is completely arbitrary. I got three or four major plot points wrong. And I got, once again, John Ford and John Houston mixed up. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I look back on it in my work as, oh, I don't know, uh, with nostalgia, with fondness. Sure. But I hope with enough sense to understand that I had good days and bad days and yeah. that I would prefer not to encounter the bad days. <laughs> but I read one the other day. I read it and I thought, what the, who wrote this crap? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you got to feel that way. Do you ever feel that way about some of the, I mean, you got 20, 20 novels under your belt. Do you ever go back and if somebody references one of your uh, earlier books and you go, what was I thinking with that? Do you ever get that feeling in that situation? I spare myself that. Oh, I okay. don't reread. Uh, once it's done, I like to leave it done. Yeah. I have, in fact, in one book, which was built on another book, I couldn't force myself to reread it. So I asked a friend of mine to reread it and give me notes. Uh, so and he may have made some mistakes. So those mistakes got threatened got carried over into the book I was working on. So I'm one of the few writers who has gotten stuff wrong about his own earlier books. <laughs> and, uh, for example, Bob Lee Swagger's wife, in some books her name is Julie, and in other books her name is Jen. And even if you ask me now, I'm not sure which it's supposed to be. <laughs> and uh, again, and rather than getting, you know, suicidal about it, yeah. I, I'm old enough and wise enough, I hope, just to laugh at it and understand that that's a pretty good uh, diagnosis of how my mind, which is sure. somewhat disheveled, how it operates. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a forest guy, not a trees guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if I were a trees guy, I know plenty of trees guys who are still working on the first page of their first novel 40 years later. And you've got to, if you're going to produce the stuff, you've got to do it, finish it and move on to new stuff, you know, because you're not going to last unless you give them stuff to publish and you can't get obsessed with someone said, I think it was Conrad thinking is the enemy of perfection. And what I, what he meant was, if you overthink, if you over-research, if you over-detail, you kill. And you have, you're have you working for a place where you can just sort of get your pure subconscious onto the paper. And that's always the best stuff. When it just sort of, when you feel like you're just the travel agent, you know, you're, you're supervising uh, the transmission from your subconscious to the uh, to the page, and that's all you do. You know, you're not writing, you're not consciously making decisions. It's just happening. That's that's when it seems to be the best. Now, I think that's the first time I've heard it put that eloquently, and and it really does beg the question. I love that. Is I know the you write yourself, David? So you've got. Uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm sure. Well, perhaps, but you're letting me see it through a different lens. And when you, it's kind of like, well, I'm going to use the phrase subconscious download because it's, it's an, a variation of what you just said. I love the fact that you said, uh, a lot of people call it getting in the zone. When you're in the zone and you're not thinking, you're just being or processing, whatever the phrase is, then the true story that is hidden somewhere has the ability to flow out. But if you're trying to manufacture, for lack of a better term, this, this uh, tome on wisdom or this uh, pontification of redemption, then sometimes we get all, we get all, we get in, in, in the way of ourselves, don't we? Does that make any sense? Yes, that's true. Uh, and, um, it's certainly true with me. Um, you, if you take it too seriously, it can destroy you. It, it, and if you if you worry too uh, too frantically about the the right word as opposed to the right thrust, right. it it can destroy you. And there are people who become too obsessed with words and they never finish the sentence. And and uh, again, because I am by nature conservative, I always I, I try and find a middle ground between inspiration and labor, and between research and and color, or between history and drama. I'm always negotiating uh, with myself between poles in terms of trying to find the ideal font, uh, the ideal form for the story. And sometimes it doesn't come easily. Sometimes, you know, you've 
rewrite and rewrite. You know it's not right. You just know in your heart it's not there. And you try something else. And then sooner or later, you get something that seems to be right. I had to, I've got books where I've thrown 300 pages out because they were the 300 wrong pages. Right. Or where I've, where, and this is habits frequently, where characters appear and refuse to leave the book. And they're not on any outline. I never thought of them. They just showed up at the doorstep one day walked in and took over and i'm still mystified i'm still all these years later i don't know where nick memphis came from and i have no idea what the last name memphis means i is he egyptian i don't know yeah. maybe he's from tennessee i have no idea what that means but he's been a very helpful character I love that name, by the way. Uh, so I want to I want to stay on this for one quick second because you are bringing up something that I just had a conversation with my wife the other day, uh, and and I think sometimes as writers we get so we get so uh, preoccupied and myopic about finding that right word or that right sentence. Back to your point about belaboring something and never getting past that first page. And I often wonder, Stephen, is it that we take it, you know, is there a part of us that just takes it too seriously? And I'm not saying not to be serious about our craft, but I turned to my wife, Tammy, and I said, you know, at the end of the day, honey, and this is not going to be profound, but it felt profound at the moment. At the end of the day, it's just a book. It's just a story. We're just yeah. burning a few hours of life and escaping. That's that's all it is. And sometimes we, but I need that masterpiece to be represented by that power agent that makes me, that validates my, you know, artistic license, you know? That, that is a very good description of it. You know, one of the things you're also doing, and I think you're, you're getting at and describing is you're in altered states when you're writing. And sometimes the states are helpful to your writing and sometimes they're not. And, uh, and another way of looking at it is there, it, there isn't just one talent. There are sub talents and there are some things you're good at and some things you're not good at. And you're always negotiating. You're trying to get more of the stuff you're good at in, but you don't want to overdo it. A perfect example in my mind is John Updike. A wonderful, you know, a magnificent writer. Believe me, I not in a million years would I ever compare myself to him. But I did feel that he was too in love with the word. And the, the books are so, the prose is so magical, but the prose sometimes interferes with the story, with the narrative, with the human uh, reality of the situation. And it becomes about itself. And, uh, you know, maybe you're not helped by, uh, giving the reader a moment when he says, holy cow, look at that simile. He compared a lizard's, a plastic garbage bag to the skin of an alligator. I never would have thought of that, you know? <laughs> and then you realize you have no idea who the character is or what he's writing about. You just know that simile was a knockout and you, you can do that to yourself. And I have tendencies in those directions. And, uh, you know, I've gotten more float, fluid and more, uh, uh, more fluent, I would like to say, and more ironic as I've gotten older. But some of the criticism of the new book is that it's not like the old books, which were a lot drier and a lot less self-indulgent. And the only thing I could say is I'm not the person that wrote those old books anymore, right? changed this is who i am if you don't like it uh oh, yeah it's the wastebasket right over there and it's all i can do steven that is such an exceptional point and oh my god that's so good because the book that you were writing at number one and number two how could that person that craftsman that author be the same now at number 20 there's there's no way so why would we think why would we assume or hope that the creator of that story would still be like number one, number two. And I think there's a point where you just go, 
I have changed. I have matured. I have seasoned, if you will. I have marinated. So I want the new marination, the new marinade that I'm putting on this barbecue, if you will, because I'm always eating barbecue, to taste this way. Yeah, you always, and see, that's one of the reasons why I don't care to reread my books, because I don't want to meet the person I was. Right. Uh, that person was good enough for 1987, right. but I'm not sure he would fit into 2021, and I don't want to be him. Right. I, I wrote a book. I can't. I, I, one of my books set in World War II had reference to my very first book, The Master Sniper of 1980. Uh, so I was looking at it 30 years later, and I did go through it. And I, one of the things I noticed was that it was very much written in homage to uh, the Frederick Forsyth book, Day of the Jackal, that is the oh. first book. And the villain was a remorseless killer like the Jackal was. But when I read those remorseless killing scenes over again, they made me very uh, uncomfortable. And I didn't, I was uncomfortable with that sort of mechanical uh, evil. Uh, that just didn't seem to me to, to be real. It seemed to me to be, it fit the template of the psychopath that Forsyth invented. But now that I'm older, I doesn't seem to me that it's a very convincing picture of evil. And that, and that even, I mean, one of the ways I try and do bad people, I, I always try and give a villain a moment of grace or a moment of mercy or kindness, because that's also part of human DNA. Sure. This idea of the bad guy is a robot of sheer evil. Uh, certain people like that exist, but I don't care to live in their skins over 350 pages. So in, in that, that's the sort of meeting uh, of the previous occupants work that I, I care not to encounter at this moment. You know, and let's go ahead and uh, jump into Targeted. Uh, by the way, and you're making me think of, is it v vodka? Vodka, right? Not vodka, which we'll get to a little bit in a little bit. Okay. But vodka, the uh, the head uh, Russian guy who's the bad guy, he is merciless and uh, seems stoic in that I will just, I will kill and we'll be on our way and it doesn't matter to me. But then you kind of find out that there is a little bit of a, heartbeat behind him but anybody everybody knows about bob lee swagger and his in his pops earl and something uh i have to ask this question I, i'm sure you've answered it a million times Stephen. so let's just start here where did bob lee that character that we all know and love and can relate to where did he come from uh well every time i tell this story it's different okay so, <laughs> uh, who knows what i'll say this time <laughs> he i there's certain attractions to the sniper uh, or to the tale of assassination because of the various formats of thriller. Those are the easiest to keep organized because yeah. the problem is clear on every page. The uh, uh, conflict is clear on every page. The, 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 the good in the, 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 the good people and the bad people are clear on every page and it's sort of pre-configured towards climax. And I actually decided I failed the two novels. Uh, I'm going way back to the late 1970s. And I decided to write a sniper novel called the master sniper about an OSS team hunting for a German sniper. And I knew that the concept of sniper was resonant, partly because of the, the assassination of Kennedy. Uh, it was still, you know, the sniper was already a villain in American culture. And so I wrote that book, blah, blah, blah. And then I wrote a variety of other books that were, in retrospect, I, I invented a new book and a new universe each time. And uh, it was, some were good, some were bad. I don't care to really revisit them. Uh, I wrote a book about the Spanish Civil War, and everyone would say to me, was that the one where Teddy Roosevelt wrote up San Juan Hill? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get back to the single, the assassin, and because I'm into guns, yeah. 
Yeah. He would be a gun assassin, which perforce makes him a sniper. But I wanted him to be the good guy. And I found uh, a Marine sniper named Carlos Halfcock, who was highly thought of. He was the record number of kills in Vietnam, but he had some tragedy in his life. His spotter was killed. Uh, spotter being his assistant, the guy on the big telescope. Uh, and that made him very interesting to me because that I thought that would give him some sort of tragic grace, some sort of focus of, of, uh, of regret, some sadness, and he wouldn't be a real gung-ho cigar chomper, but he'd be a thoughtful man and he would know. I also thought of him as, as the Faust of war in that he had seen things that nobody else had seen. He had done things that nobody else had done, but he also, uh, he also, he, he, all that came at a cost and the cost was exile. And when we discover him, he is at the far marginal margins of society. He is an alcoholic or recovered alcoholic living alone in a trailer in the woods with his uh, dog and his rifle and no liquor in the, in the trailer. And uh, I sort of wanted to, the arc not only of that first book, but of the whole series has been bringing him back to civilization. And at a certain point when he got back to civilization, I made it about bringing other snipers back to civilization. Yeah. And that was always a very poignant uh, arc for me. That was something I could invest in uh, emotionally and, uh, and uh, somewhat, you know, compassionately. And I thought it was a very interesting process. And I loosely based Bob on uh, Carlos Halfcock in the beginning but then at a certain part in writing that book, it just wasn't working. So I had to go through and sub and self-consciously give him, he was a tracing. He was just dull. And I had to sort of imbue him. I had to break away from the modality and I had to give him a humanity. And that's where his backstory came from. I wanted to know what created him. And once I started thinking about that, I got into the whole swagger clan. And that I think made him much more vivid in my mind and much more vivid on the page. And the dynamics of his mind uh, became very alive and very meaningful for me. And I always wondered where that came from. So I then was able to go back to his father and then I went back to his father's father and now, as you know, it, I went back to 1780 with the swagger, the origin of the swaggers. And it just, uh, he, he, so he came from a combination of my mercenary hunger to write a new book, my, my uh, fascination with the Marine sniper, uh, Carlos Halfcock, and uh, with, uh, uh, just the sort of the professional awareness of what kinds of stories uh, would be the easiest to construct and, and to tell. Uh, and I, I thought hard about thriller format or right. thriller structure and the c collision course uh, between the sniper and the sniper, the counter sniper. That was very vivid but it was also very it was easier and so that's sort of i went the way of path of least resistance and so in the core of all my books or most of my books there will be that sniper counter sniper duel going on sure. and uh you know who knows if i thought of something else that night i'm sitting at a kitchen table in columbia maryland my wife and kids were snoozing upstairs there may have been some liquor involved. I'm not real <laughs> sure on that. But that's when it started. And once it started, okay. it refused to stop. And that's why I'm here. 
Well, and speaking of stopping, I know this is number 12, as, uh, so it's a, an even dozen, but I, I was listening to, I think it was uh, your buddy Jack Carr and Barbara Peters of the Poison Pen talking about that there's a rumor that he may be going away. Is Did I hear that right? Uh, well, I'll uh, give you a secret. I don't think I've ever told this to anyone. I actually, in one of my books, I won't tell you which one, though it's probably pretty obvious, I'd actually had him killed. And I, I, uh, I thought that uh, it was time to, to do away with him. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I loved him, but I just was sort of running out of uh, Bob Lee Swagger gas, if you will, you know. I didn't know there would be a reserve tank. Yeah. And uh, Sater minds prevail because this is finally it's a business, you know, and I have obligations and I want to live in a reasonably nice house. Right. <laughs> Plenty of martinis. I welfare, you know. I, 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 I want to uh, be able to have a that martini, you know, I want to be able to afford the vodka. Yeah. So I, I <laughs> didn't kill him. I wounded him. And uh, then I, that made him interesting too. The wounded, the grievously wounded Bob Lee Swagger. And, you know, he is very old. He's my age. He's 75 now. He's not going to be kicking down doors or running upstairs or, you know, getting in jujitsu fights with anyone. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, I've come to understand that as much as people like the guns and they like the shooting and they like the action sequence, the thing that really makes the books work is that you believe in his mind and his capacities for detection and deduction and analysis and his solution to problems, uh, his way to see into the heart of issues that no one else could see into. And that's been fun. That's been great fun. Yeah. So he's 74, 75 here in Targeted. And my favorite, I, I to this day, Shooter remains one of my favorite uh, books with Mark Wall or movies. I'm trying to think of the name of the book that it was based upon. Point of Impact. Point of Impact. Yeah. Um, how old was Bob Lee in Point of uh, Shooter? Well, he was uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. I published it in 1993. He's my age, so that I could primarily so that I could answer that question. So why don't you subtract? 1946 from 1993 and that'll give you the answer 47 7 yeah okay so he was 47 okay, when this okay. Started. he had 20 years as a drunk uh well he had a couple years as a failure he had 20 years as a drunk and then he sort of rebuilt himself by reading and i see i think that's another thing people like that he he cured himself he'd go to a program he didn't, you know, this do all the sort of self-help things other than gut it out. You know, he did it for himself and he remade himself. And he, the man he became was much more widely read and much more thoughtful. He, he sort of reclaimed his soul, if you will. And that made him, again, I thought that made him interesting. One of my favorite characters was this uh, Madam Chairman Charlotte Venable, uh, a.k.a. Mother Death. I, I could not I wait till she... was a movie guy. No one has gotten the name yet. Do you get the name Charlotte Venable? No. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Okay. Okay, it's Catherine Hepburn in Suddenly Last Summer. Oh. It was Charlotte Venable who was persecuting Elizabeth Taylor uh, because Elizabeth Taylor knew this truth about her, her only gay son. Uh, she'd been married to him and she wanted uh, Elizabeth Taylor put away uh, so that uh, uh, she wouldn't tell the truth about Sebastian Venable. And that's one of, it, it, it's a great, it's a great old timey movie. But Hepburn is great in that movie. You know, she is charming. She is vivacious. She is powerful. She is charismatic. And she's wonderfully, deliciously, self-righteously evil. And so <laughs> it was a great, 
a kick to me to call her Charlotte Venable. And I kept waiting for someone to point that out. And, you know, Man. <laughs> no one has I'm yet. Oh, I'm sorry I dropped that ball, but boy, I just loved her mother death. Uh, I, I often do this, Stephen, when I'm making notes and I'm reading books. I, I will find certain sections that I really like, and I'll I'll try to go, how would I describe this? Like, I'll often be, my my wife will ask me, how, how would you describe that book? Uh, how would you describe Stephen's style, having never read it? And I'm like, well, and this is what I came out. I'm like, imagine like Hunter S. Thompson meets Elmore Leonard with a with a dash of Rambo, but with a really caustic and acerbic wit. <laughs> I, I could die on that. That's a real good one. That's uh, you got it all. That's all. That, that's it. That's my only trick, by the way. I have no other tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know we're running out of time. I, I just want to do a, a real quick little wrap up here. And uh, uh, I'd love to know this. And I think I've gotten a little bit of this along the way, but I want to be a little more succinct before we get into our rapid fire questions. What if you were speaking to a room full of up and coming writers, people who really wanted to make this a career, do you have kind of that quintessential succinct piece of advice that you could say uh, yes i do and it, it it's act like any piece of advice it's reflective more of my issues than reality but my issue was always i am damned lazy so my issue <laughs> is always been getting out of the damn chair and sitting down at the damn keyboard and unless you could do that i say to people unless you could do that it's just not going to happen Nothing is going to happen. So you have to work out a way to do that. Uh, I've thought about, I have always played with the idea of writing a book about writing books. And the name of that book would be The Theory and Practice of the Chair. And the reason for that is that all writing begins with a chair. And unless you make peace with the chair, unless it becomes your friend instead of your enemy, you're going to fail. It's easy to over-dramatize writing and to make it seem romantic and heroic and like an ordeal. That's death. Well, that's never going to happen. It has to become habit. It has to become like brushing your teeth. So you do it without, without any psychic effort. Because if you're counting on your will to get you to the keyboard every day, sooner or later, you're going to miss a day and then you're going to miss a week, and then you're going to miss a year, and then you're going to miss a life. And that's, that had happened. I failed at a number of books. I've watched them die, and I know the uh, termination process. And so the main thing I always say, I, I have a little thing, uh, a little saying where I say, I could teach you how to write a novel in six words. Okay. Do you want those six words? Yes. Okay. The first two words are start now. Don't worry about research. Don't worry about mood. Don't worry about anything. Forget all that. Start now. The next three words are work every day. And so many people, I run into this over and over, people who say, well, I'll get down to it as soon as I finish my research. And guess what? You're never going to finish your research and you're never going to research that book. You can research while you write. And it may even be more efficient because you know specifically what you need as to, as opposed to knowing uh, background. I'm a vertical researcher. I'm uh, the key to my great research is I know how to use an index. Uh, and the last word is finish. If you don't finish the damn thing, you'll never get in the game. You've got to have something to show them. Because everyone can get someone somewhere to look at it. And to do that, you've got to have a product. You've got to have a thing. And the turnaround in my career where I was able to jump from wannabe to having done was when an editor whom I met serendipitously said to me, do you have anything to show me? And I did. 
And I, I, if I didn't, if I hadn't, I, I, you wouldn't be talking to me. Uh, I'd be, uh, I'd be the oldest, bitterest guy on the sun copy desk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I had something to show her. And it was a book that was never published, but it convinced her that I had the chops to, to do the thing to start, to finish, to write it well, and to make it happen professionally. And that's how it, that's, that's how, when she read a few months later, the first hundred pages of The Master Sniper, she offered me a contract. And that's how the whole damn circus got, got its start. Wow. I had, I had something to show her. You gotta have a thing. You've got to finish what you start. Boom. Start now, Boom. work every day, finish. Six yeah. words. I love it. Uh, it's rapid fire questions. Uh, and it's really, the funny thing is, it's not really all that fast. It's really more about spontaneity. But if you and the real Bob Swagger could sit down at the dinner table and have a conversation for real, real life, what would be the one thing that you would ask him? And, and I, I realize that you already know him, but. <clears throat> well, you know, one of my guilts and. Uh, things that I feel bad about, but I can't help is that I write about war and combat. And I have never, I've been in the army, but I've never been in war and combat. Nobody has ever tried to kill me. I've never tried to kill anyone. Uh, and I, but I try and make that part of it hyper real. And so I would have to say to him, and this is a question not about him, but about me. I'd have to say to him, Bob, <laughs> Bob, did I get it kind of right? Is it okay? Did I, did I get it okay? So that would be the question. And that would be more for my own uh, peace and uh, peace of mind than for anything. I mean, I already know everything about him because sure. I made him up. Sure, but, sure. If, but that would be the question that I would ask. And I, you know, I do know Jack Carr who has been there and done that. Oh yeah. And uh, he, He's a very decent guy. He's been very respectful to me. So I am inferring from that that I got it right. Although I have never asked him if I got it right. I just, I don't think I will. Well, he, it, it, do you think there's a bigger fan on the planet than Jack Carr is? He's had a great career and he yeah. works like the devil. I couldn't work that hard because I'm lazy. But he, <laughs> uh, I mean, you see the seal in him that, I will not quit mentality that just drove him, got him through six months of SEAL training and then 11 deployments in, in uh, the sandbox. And, uh, you know, he went into the Navy as a seaman and he came out as a uh, lieutenant commander. So what does that tell you? Uh, he ended, you know, he went in as a seaman, he came out in command of all Navy sniper Navy SEAL snipers in Afghanistan. What does that tell you about the guy's uh, drive and seriousness of purpose and commitment to the, the work that has to be done? So, I mean, what astounds me about him to this day is how busy he is. He says, okay, uh, call me at 11. I think I have a window between 11 and 1107. Do you have a window then? <laughs> Oh, I have a window that lasts that entire week, Jack. So I think I'll be able to call you in 1,100 hours. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, we're going to wrap this up here. My wife and I are hosting a cocktail party at our home and have invited you and the missus to join us. We're asking that you, and this is going to be so interesting to me, ask that you invite two people to join the four of us to round out things, make the discussion more interesting. They can be living or past so who are those two people and why? Oh, I would definitely say Hemingway. Mm -hmm. I don't like Hemingway. I, I love Hemingway's, you know, I think of the bad things I've done and I get very depressed, but then I look at the bad things he did. And I feel much <laughs> better about myself. <laughs> I need a tired king like him in my life. So Hemingway would be one. Oh gosh. And Orwell would be the other. I'm, a uh, great admirer of not merely the writing, but also the character and the honesty and the sheer guts of George Orwell. So the two of them. 
And I don't think the two of them would get along. So uh, maybe that would be another writer, maybe maybe Faulkner, because he would probably say nothing. And uh, I, could, I could talk more about myself that way. <laughs> Stephen, you are a hoot. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. You've been very gracious and very fun. And, uh, I, I'm very pleased, David. It was a great interview. This was so much fun for me. Uh, well, listen, thank you again. Have a lovely day. And we're going to let you get off to your... Uh, oh, tell me your preparation of the martini, because I got to... No, no, no. My preparation of the martini is, honey, it's Friday. That's how I prepare a martini. <laughs> Cheers to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, David. Thanks again to Stephen for joining me. What a treat. Now, how about next week's guest? Before I share that, I want to say a quick but heartfelt thank you for all of you who are currently supporting this show by way of encouragement and social sharing. I love it when I find out a new listener has been introduced to the show by a friend because there's no better compliment than positive word of mouth. Also, I'd like to ask if you do me one small favor. If you watch us on YouTube, or even if you don't, but you'd like to help pal out, would you go to youtube.com slash David Temple Author and just click on that red button to subscribe to our channel. It sounds like a small thing, but you see, I'm trying to change the name from David Temple Author to The Thriller Zone. Imagine that. But YouTube tells me I need 100 subscribers before they can officially change the name. And in less than 45 more subscribers, we'll be there. So thank you in advance. Now on to next week's special guest. She's the Sunday Times bestselling author of 14 novels, including Our House, which won the Fiction, Crime, and Thriller Book of the Year at the 2019 British Book Awards. Louise Candlish is her guest. And we'll discuss her latest thriller, The Heights, as we kick off March. That's it for now, folks. I'm David Temple saying thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on The Thriller Zone.